What's going on guys, my name is Jake, you're watching Meat Source, and today we're gonna to be talking about buying a secondhand or a used laptop. Now, buying a used laptop or a laptop in general can be a pretty daunting task. There are so many options to choose from, and honestly, this can seem pretty scary to a lot of people. How do you choose the right laptop? Well, this video is gonna be an attempt to help get through that process and explain some of the things. I'm making this video because I recently purchased a laptop and I thought it might be a good idea to kind of go through the process that I went through when deciding on the laptop that I ended up finally getting. Now the process that I go through is about five steps and I'll go through with those with you soon. Following these five steps, I managed to pick myself up an ASUS ROG GL704GM, which is basically the Strix SCAR 2. It's a 17 inch machine. It's got GTX 1060 and an eighth gen i7 processor, more mobile processor in it. Now, a little disclaimer, laptops or computer parts in general, uh, they're tricky. There's, there's a lot a lot of uh, variation and things in between. This is for people that really have pretty much zero understanding of what they're looking for, and possibly even people that might have an idea of some bits and pieces and parts, but this is pretty basic, guys, so try not to knock it too hard. I'm trying to simplify things as much as I can just to make it easiest for the person that might be watching this that has no bloody clue what they're looking for. That being said, if you feel like I've missed something out, definitely throw it in the comments below. And if it's definitely important, I will pin it to the top so everyone can see it. Anyway, let's get into it. Step number one, you need to find the purpose of the machine. Why are you getting this laptop? What do you need it for? Now, normally this falls under three categories. They are work, so internet usage, document processing, and depending on your line of work, maybe even image and video editing. Number two, play. So that includes internet, gaming, streaming. And the third is leisure. Basically, you're just getting this because you want to, something else to browse the internet on, maybe you want a bigger screen. And that being said, you'll find throughout this entire video that Number three is pretty much not focused on very much because people generally don't buy computers for that reason anymore. Due to the fact that phones and tablets are just so incredibly powerful for what that for that purpose, that makes sense. So it's unlikely you're viewing this for that reason, is what I'm getting at. Here he comes, old man's about to speed by on his motorbike. He's some kind of asshole. Mm -hmm. I was gonna show him, but he decided not to crawl as fast this time. Motherfucker, he was pissing me off. Well, that's it for step number one. Step number two, you need to know your costs, your, your, your budget, mate. You need to work out your budget down to the very dollar that you're willing to spend on this thing. Um, that's your maximum. Now, that being said, just because 800, for example, is your max, doesn't mean that you can't shop for $1,000 secondhand laptops. We'll get further into that, uh, I think, in step five. Step number three, trio. I think that's Mexican, Latin, I don't know. Research. Research is one of the most important things you should be doing, especially when, when you're buying anything. Like, unless it's a carrot, do some research. <laughs> so you know the purpose, you know your budget, it's time to start researching on what you need to fulfill that purpose and what you can achieve with your budget. Now, this part can get pretty involved and it isn't entirely easy to answer, but I will try my god dang best. Using your purpose, we're gonna decide what essential components you need to fulfill that. So basically using the purpose, we're gonna decide on what components you need that are essential. There are gonna be some non-essential parts and some essential parts, especially for the reasons that you need this machine. Non-essentials are a bonus, but the essentials are a must. As you may or may not know, the main six components to a laptop or even any computer, but a laptop with these six, they are the CPU, the GPU, the RAM, the storage, and the battery, and the screen. I nearly forgot that one. All of these components are important, but some are more or less important than the others, depending on your use case. If you're looking for a machine to work on, depending on your work, you're gonna be looking for a machine that can handle a lot of tabs while browsing the internet, while handling multiple important documents, and maybe even at the same time, trying to 
edit and open videos and images at the same time. I don't know, you could be putting that shit into a PowerPoint presentation. I, I don't know, but you might be. And that's what's important. If you're looking for a machine to play on, most games these days require a beefy GPU and a shitload of RAM. And the CPU can hold a certain amount of importance depending on what you're planning on doing with that machine. If you're just planning on gaming, CPU is important, but not overly important but if you want to stream at the same time then all of a sudden cpu becomes a huge fucking deal and if you're just planning on doing leisure uh, the all these parts are important but not like high-end parts aren't nearly as important now let's dive a little bit deeper into each of these categories of components and i'll tell you which ones you should aim for for each type of use case that you are planning on using it for now after i finish filming this video i'm going to put timestamps below so you can skip through to each part and that way you can kind of skip through it and miss all the parts that don't really apply to you. Let's start off with the display. Display is incredibly important. It's the thing you're looking at right now to view this video. I know, mind blowing, insane. And when it comes to work, aim for a display that can push out at least minimum 1080p, full HD. It's pretty much impossible not to find a display that can't do that anymore, but don't aim for anything less. And something that, that you may not have thought of is its color accuracy. Now, depending on the type of work that you're doing, if you're just editing documents, don't worry about this part, doesn't matter. But if you're doing imaging and video, this is incredibly important. Color accuracy is important when you're doing your first edit because you don't want to edit something on your machine and then only to see it later on a different machine, say a phone, and it looks completely different from what you originally were hoping it to look like. Happens a lot. Color accuracy can be difficult to understand, but I'll try and make it as basic as possible. What you need is your display to cover a certain color gamut or a certain percentage of that gamut. And there are two gamuts, there's the sRGB and the Adobe RGB. Basically, the closer you are to hitting 100% of each of these two color gamuts or color spaces, the better and the more likely you are to see accurate results between all different types of displays. Um, an example of using a poor display and then seeing poor results later on would be in some of my earlier videos on that I did for this uh, YouTube channel. Um, I used a display that had really poor color accuracy. On the display I tuned it up so the brightness and the contrast was really high up and really pushed up the reds for my skin tones. On the display I was using, it looked great. Well, it didn't look great, but it looked a lot better. It, did, it looked really flat and lame before. So I pumped everything up to make it look really bright and poppy. Turns out when I viewed that on a phone later on, that had a lot better color accuracy, I just looked way overblown and red. I just looked bright red, and that's not what you want. So that's an example and of using a poor ac color accurate dis display versus a accurate color display. Now, finding 100% in both categories is gonna be very hard and it's very expensive, but you can get good results with like 95% and higher. It is a lot more common to find 95% than it is 100% in both. It's just something worth considering. When it comes to gaming, um, if you're only gaming, don't worry about color accuracy. What you want to be looking for is at least, again, minimum 1080p, and you want to be looking for fast response times. Uh, response time is measured in milliseconds and is normally, uh, it's the difference between clicking a button and seeing the action on screen. Now you wanna aim for as low uh, as possible when it comes to milliseconds. So one millisecond, three milliseconds, four milliseconds, they're all still good. Uh, you just don't want one that's like up in the 20s or up in the 30s. It's, it might not sound like much, but that's a big difference, especially when you're playing like Twitch shooters or anything like that, where you need quick reaction times. It can be the difference between you winning and you losing. The next thing to consider with displays and gaming is the refresh rate. Um, the refresh rate of a display is measured in hertz and most monitors or displays come at 60 hertz, which means it can display 60 frames per second. This section kind of links in with your GPU. If you've got a middle range GPU graphics processor that isn't capable of pushing out a game more than 60 frames per second, then you may as well have a 60 hertz screen. If you had a GTX 1050 and you can only play Fortnite at 55 frames per second, having a 120, uh, 20, 120 hertz screen, you're not going to see any benefit. There's no point. You're forking out money for things that aren't even going to be utilized. But 
if you have a GPU like a GTX 1070 or 2070 or whatever, that is more worth it. That's more worth your time. That's when you're gonna want that 120 hertz screen or 144 hertz screen. This is, you need to do some research. Find out what card you're looking for and what kind of refresh rate you need for that. And leisure, doesn't even matter, mate. Don't even worry about it. Just aim for something that's 1080p, goes bright enough. You just want it to look nice when you're viewing it during the daylight, I guess. At night, you're not really gonna notice or care. Enough about displays. Let's move on to some more core components like the CPU, the brain, the processor, man. When it comes to work, you're gonna want at least a quad-core multi-threaded processor. Now, this is normally an Intel i5 or higher or an AMD Ryzen 3 or higher. Now, all of these processors that I'm gonna be mentioning, they have big old names like an 8700K or 8700HS and things like that. These are important to look at, but that's a whole nother video and there's plenty of other videos out there about that. Go to Linus Tech Tips. He's got lots of videos explaining all those numbers. For now, I'm just gonna aim at the base number, the i3s, the i5s and so on. Quad-core multi-threaded processor is important for multitasking, especially when you're at work. There's nothing worse than you're trying to meet a deadline and your computer is freezing up because you've got too many tabs open and you just, you need to get this done now and it's not letting you get it done now. This is especially important if you're doing things like video and photo editing. Certain programs like Photoshop and Premiere and DaVinci Resolve all take advantage of multi-core, multi-threaded processes. Remember that. And speaking of which, if you're aiming on doing things like that, imaging and video processing, aim higher. The more processing power, the better, but at least an i5 and at least a Ryzen 3 at least. When it comes to play, a quad-core or even a hexa-core multi-threaded processor. So these include an Intel i5 or higher or an AMD Ryzen 3 or higher again. Now, those specs can increase, I'll explain why. Games these days, generally speaking, only take advantage of single-core performance. So having a big old processor that has multi-core performance isn't necessarily going to give you huge gains at the moment. Is that being said, Microsoft and Sony are about to release their new consoles, which have really big beefy processors in them that are multi-core and multi-threaded. Games are likely to start taking advantage of these processors in the very near future. So it doesn't hurt to have a beefier processor for your gaming now, because in the future, you will thank yourself for it. But for now, you can get away with just a quad-core or a hexa-core processor. That being said, there's always one of those. If you're planning on streaming, the beefier the processor, the better. Pro, uh, streaming takes a lot of processing power and you do not want to be gaming and streaming on the, at the same time on a processor that can't handle it. Your game's gonna lag, your stream's gonna lag. It's gonna be a bad time for you and your viewer. Fork out for a better processor. And in this case, if you're gonna be streaming, aim for a Ryzen 5 or an Intel Core i7 or higher. Leisure, just, Whatever, man, <laughs> whatever you can afford. Go for like an i3, they're fine, or a Ryzen 3 again, whatever, whatever you can afford, whatever's, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're dual core, multi-threaded, quad core, you'll probably get these days anyway. You'll be fine, don't worry about it. Time to talk about the GPU. <laughs> GPU, graphics processor unit. Dedicated, integrated, what, what? What? A dedicated GPU is going to be important depending on what you're doing. Pretty much every laptop has a CPU with an integrated GPU in it anyway. So depending on your workload, you may or may not have to aim for a machine with a dedicated GPU. If you're only aiming to edit documents, then you really don't need a GPU. If you're only browsing the internet, you don't really need a GPU. Um, however, if you're planning on doing any video or photo editing, and I'm just talking about like if you're just resizing images and stuff like that, an integrated GPU will do the job, but a dedicated one will speed things up considerably. It takes all that extra load off of your CPU. It'll just give you better overall load times and responsiveness. So in the case of work, aim for something with at least an MX series graphics card from NVIDIA. And in the case of Ryzen machines, make sure it's got Vega graphics integrated within it. You're very unlikely to come across AMD graphics at the moment, you're more likely to come past NVIDIA graphics. MX series graphics are very common to find and especially within thin and light machines. They are 
the low end of the low, but they are dedicated graphics nonetheless, and they will help push your performance when it comes to video and image editing. Um, even when it comes to like doing 4K videos and stuff like that, they do help. Anything beyond that would be like a GTX 1050 or RTX or GTX 10, 1650. They are also common to find they are the lower ends, but they are, they make a world of difference. When it comes to playing games, being a gamer, a mad gamer, dedicated graphics is of the utmost importance. Do not buy a PC without a dedicated graphics card. For anything serious, aim for a GTX 1060 or higher, while a 1050 will allow you, or even an MX card will allow you to game, you will have a much better responsive time playing on a 1060 or higher. As a general rule of thumb, understanding the numbering for graphics cards is relatively simple when it comes to 10 or 20 series cards. The higher the number, the better the power. The higher the number, the more expensive it comes, the more power sucking it becomes and the heavier the machine you will have will be the thicker the actual base of the machine so you'll get 1060 1070 1080 then you get 20 uh, 1650 2060 2070 2080 this is for nvidia graphics now amd now releases graphics for mobile use cases as well they have for a while but don't get anything lower than an rx series card it's for amd cards i can't remember if i explained that amd rx or higher for leisure again it really does not matter a integrated gpu from your cpu will be just fine ram random access memory ram is often overlooked by a lot of people and it's unfortunate because ram Having enough of it is the difference between having a few tabs open and editing your documents or gaming and experiencing the worst time of your life or having just a perfectly normal time. If your computer runs out of RAM, it will slow down considerably. It will lag, it will hit cup, it will even crash. Low RAM is a bad thing. Now, a lot of laptops, unfortunately, they have integrated soldered RAM, which means the RAM is physically attached to the board. It cannot be removed. It cannot be upgraded. So whatever you decide on now is what will, you will have for the rest of time as long as you've got that laptop. Eight gigabytes is very, very common to find within a laptop. It will be fine for some use cases, but it is highly recommended to go to 16 or in fact more. 16 gigabytes is the golden area, the golden amount of RAM at the moment. For example, just as I was writing the script for this video, I had four Chrome tabs open and Microsoft Word. I was using five gigabytes of RAM. If I only had eight gigabytes of RAM, I would be nearly out already. They weren't even big sites. That was just, I was just doing some research. Um, and it was like one page or two pages of text on Word. So as you can see, I was only three gigs away from having a slow crashing computer. As programs become more advanced, they will use more RAM. If you're planning on doing anything like video or photo editing or even especially streaming, the more RAM, the better. Go higher than 16 gigs if you can. 32 gigabytes is perfect. You will have a jolly good time on 32 gigs of RAM. You can do it on 16 gigs. You'll probably in fact be fine, but go higher if you can and explore the possibility of upgradability for your machine. As I was saying before, most machines have soldered RAM, but research the model of your machine. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later on. Find out if you can upgrade the RAM. For example, in this machine, it came with a single stick of 16 gigabytes of RAM. I had one slot available. I was able just to buy one 16 gigabyte RAM slot, um, card and put it in there and I had 32 gigs of RAM. I have more than enough for any task that I'm gonna be doing now. <sighs> we're nearly there, guys. The next section we're gonna talk about is storage. Now, this has become less important over time uh, due to two factors. We've got external storage, such as USB drives and external hard drives, and we have cloud storage. However, this could still be a very big uh, considering factor for you, depending on your use case. Storage comes in two forms, predominantly in the laptop world. It comes in HDD, hard drive, and SSD, solid state drives. Without going too far into it, an SSD is like up to four times, even on the high end, way more than that, faster than a, uh, 
a HDD or a hard drive. However, it is far more expensive per gigabyte compared to a hard drive, which in turn, the opposite, a hard drive is roughly four times slower than a basic SSD, but it's far more cheaper to buy per gigabyte of storage. For example, a 256 gigabyte SSD might set you back 120 bucks. There you go. A one terabyte hard drive will cost you $100. So you've got four times the amount of storage for $20 less than the SSD, but you're also four times slower. Now, most thin and light laptops will have only one of these. They normally, these days, not normally, pretty much all the time, they have only the SSD. A machine that's slightly thicker, like a gaming laptop, will have both, a combination of both, an SSD and a hard drive. For example, an Apple Mac only has an SSD. My laptop, the, uh, the ROG Strix, has an SSD and a hard drive. When choosing your machine, if it only has an SSD, do not buy one lower than 128 gigs. In fact, 128 gigs is still very low. Aim for 256 or more. If you're looking to store a lot of big files, and this includes games or videos that you may be editing or incredibly huge amounts of documents, look for a computer that has a dedicated one terabyte hard drive as well. Now, as I was saying, this isn't as important as it used to be. You can, if, if your only options are low storage options, just buy yourself a really nice external hard drive or an external SSD made by Samsung or SanDisk. There are plenty of options out there now that are relatively cheap and you can get away perfectly just fine with that. My only one recommendation is don't buy a computer with only a hard drive. These are incredibly slow. They can be upgraded, which is a bonus. If it's got a hard drive, the hard drive is always upgradable. You can't integrate a hard drive, but you can integrate an SSD. Just like the RAM, I can't remember if I mentioned this before, a lot of manufacturers integrate the SSD these days, which is a terrible act, but it happens anyway. So choose that storage limit that you want because you may or may not be stuck with that for the rest of that computer's lifetime. <sighs> right on, all right, all right, all right. We can move on to, we can finally move on guys in life and in our minds and in our souls to the battery. Battery. Um, it's something to consider. Um, a lot of people do not uh, consider this, but it's definitely, depending on what you want to do, it's something definitely to worth getting in the old noggin there. Um, the larger the battery, the longer it will last. Duh, right? You know, everyone gets that. Um, but if you're using a beefy ass machine, like a high-end gaming machine, you want a big battery. Um, if you're planning on doing a lot of travel, you're gonna want a big battery. Generally speaking, laptop manufacturers will advertise their battery life in hours. Like literally, they'll say 10 hours of on-screen time. Not really a good metric to work off of because they always set the brightness all the way down to like 10%. They're in like a cool room where the air conditioning's all working really well. Not a really good metric to work off of. They're always bullshit. Like nine times out of 10 is bullshit. It's bullshit. If you live near a PowerPoint 99% of the time, doesn't really matter. If you don't, think about this. The best way to measure a laptop's battery is in watt hours. W H. Um, this can be very complicated, but the easiest way to go about this, the maximum internal integrated battery you're allowed to travel with within a like a laptop or a phone is 100 watt hours. So a good rule of thumb is to aim for a laptop that is close to that number, 97, 87, 67, like that you, you'll find that they'll always be within that range. And laptop manufacturers are never going to build their laptops with batteries that are higher than the traveling limit. You know what I'm saying? You get that? You get that. Good, 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 good. Woo! God damn. Um, that's it for the components. I hope that made sense. Let's move on to step four. Step four is choosing. Choosing the laptop that you want to buy now that you know all this other shit. Now that you know the laptop you're looking for, it's time to hit the marketplace. Look on Facebook, look on Gumtree, look on Craigslist, look on eBay, depending on the location that you're in, you probably know these places that you go to more than I do. Type in laptop and see what comes up. Some people will list their laptops with exact model numbers and the specs of their machine. Others might only put laptop or gaming laptop or 
fully six subwoofer gaming laptop max FPS. Don't ever trust these people to know what they're talking about. And in fact, always assume that they don't. It's the easiest way. Assume they have no idea what they're selling and what they're talking about. When you first make contact with the seller, ask for the exact model number. This model number can normally be found on the bottom of the laptop or on the box or the original packaging if they still have it. Once you can get that model number, search it in Google. Find the exact specs of that machine and use the information I gave you in the previous part of this video to help you decide on what you need. It's important to consider that a lot of laptops will have a model number and a sub model number. For example, the laptop that I recently got had a sub model number. Buyer originally told me that it was a Asus GL704G. Upon researching, I found that there were three other variants of this model the GM, the GV, and the GW. I asked the seller to send me another screenshot of the exact model number and everything else involved with it. And I realized, I found that the model he was selling was the GM, which was equipped with a GTX 1060 which is perfect for what I need it for. Now using the model number, you can also find out many other important specs like the CPU, the RAM, the storage, everything like that. Finally, we can move on to the final and fifth step, which is buying the machine. Look guys, it's important to remember at the end of the day, we are all human beings. The person selling the item is always going to want the most money that they can get for that item. And they're normally gonna overestimate the price for said item. This is either going to get them more money than they expected from someone who is not willing to bargain or it is going to get them the price that they originally expected or get them close to it at least. For example, I only expect $800 for my laptop that I want to sell. I'm going to list it for $1,000. A buyer confronts me and says, I'll give you 750. And I say, look, I'll give it to you 800, done deal. The buyer agrees and they're happy because they just saved 200 bucks on that $1,000 laptop. You are just as happy because you managed to get the original expected price that you had stored in your mind. So remember that as someone buying a laptop. Know your max price and bargain for a lower price on the original item. Just remember, don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be too outrageous and don't go too low. If you've done your research, you should know the general value of that item and how much you're willing to pay for it. Be respectful when asking someone for a lower price to say, look, this is all I can afford. If you can't reach that, then that's fine. I understand, maybe keep me in the back of your mind. Don't be a dick about it. There are a lot of people that are dicks about it. Once you've agreed on the price, before you meet with the seller, ask them not to format the disc. If it's not too late, do not format. This is for one reason. You want to see the specs yourself first and you can access these specs without opening up the computer, basically, like physically opening up the machine. Tell them once you're happy with the machine, they can then factory reset it. And a factory reset generally on a modern computer will only take about 15 minutes. If they agree, you can open the machine, make sure it's turned on and logged on and press Control Shift Escape. A window will pop up called the Task Manager, and if it isn't already, select Show More Details. If it says Less Detail, you can skip that step. It's already expanded. After this, select the Performance tab up the top, and from here, you can see each un tab underneath that, which will tell you the CPU, the GPU, the RAM, the storage, everything. All the main components of that computer will be listed in there. Alternatively, you can ask the buyer to send you screenshots of each of these tabs prior. It might be a good idea to do that so you can research each one of these components before you come and make sure that you're happy with them. But the buyer might not know how to do that. It might be too much effort. Ask them if you can do that first. If the computer has already been formatted, you need to be careful. You can either take the machine and take their word for it or you can set the machine up, just click, keep clicking next on Windows Hello Process and perform the Control Shift Escape function once you're in. It will take more time, but you should always confirm that you're buying the specs that you were told that you're buying. The seller might not even always know that they're not selling you what you think you're buying. They might just not know. If you don't want to be let down, 
do that important step. You shouldn't be offending anyone. You're just making sure you're buying what you're actually looking for. At the end of the day, guys, you do not want to be buying a machine that isn't what you expected it to be because you are very, very unlikely to receive your money back in any shape or form. Knowledge is key. Anywho, guys, thank you for watching. I believe that's most of the basics. Now, there are so many things to consider when buying these new laptops. There's a lot of other things, but those are the core main things. I mean, you might want to look at what kind of I.O. does the computer have in terms of USB ports and SD card readers and everything like that. Definitely something to consider, but I just wanted to cover the main parts, the main internal components of a laptop before you buy one secondhand and that process involved. Um, if there are any questions, please throw them down below. I will try my best to answer them. Um, otherwise, yeah, hit comment, pop a comment in, hit like, um, subscribe like 18 times if you can, that'd be awesome. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next, I'll see you in the next video. Peace, bye.